the scene on the latest news. Enemy fire brought some good men down who were trying to save someone on the ground. He bowed his head, closed his eyes. That screen was his real life. I stood there thinking I can't pass this by. Shake the hand of a man who vowed to fight So my kids are safe at night
army grease coming home for one week by himself in worn out boots lost in a scene on the latest news enemy fire brought some good men down who were trying to save someone on the ground he bowed his head closed his eyes that screen was his real life I stood there thinking I can't pass this by to shake the hand of a man who vowed to fight so my kids are safe at night
Thank you. Please be seated.
Good morning and welcome to First Bible Baptist Church on this Saturday. We are grateful that you have come out for this uh, very special occasion for the memorial service for Gary Bykirk, the celebration of life for Gary Bykirk. Today we come together to honor his life. And Lolly, on behalf of Savannah and I, we want to express our deepest condolences. We love you and uh, we've been and will continue to pray for you and your whole family. Um, as we grieve, I know that um, when we heard of Gary's passing that we were very touched and obviously saddened. Um, at the same time, we rejoice in knowing that he is with our Lord and Savior and that at some time soon we will be able to join him again in, a, in that heavenly, heavenly place. I am Pastor Kevin, one of the pastors here. I welcome you to our church. Thank you for being here. Um, there are some very important people in this room today that I would like to recognize. Uh, we have some Medal of Honor recipients to my right, uh, to your left here at the north side of the sanctuary. We have Britt uh, Slabinski is here with his wife. Thank you for being here. We have Matt Williams that is here as well. We have David Bellavia that is here, Brian Thacker, and uh, Mr. Woody Williams. Thank you um, for being here. Mr. Williams is a Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. Thank you, men, for taking time out of your schedule and your life to be a part of this ceremony and service as well. Uh, we have a list of dignitaries, and, and uh, I won't be able to go through all of them, but uh, many special guests that have come here today to be a part of this service and uh, to recognize, and I'm grateful for that. Congressman Joe Morelli is here. Uh, Senator Rob Ort, the minority leader, Senator uh, Brooke is here, and Jeremy Cooney is here, Assemblyman Sarah Clark, and Assemblyman Josh Jensen is here. Uh, Senator Gillibrand wanted to be here, but uh, was unable to do that, so she did send a letter to you, Lolly, that we'll give to you a little bit later and uh, present that to you. Of course, Todd Baxter, the Monroe County Sheriff, and his wife is here. Honorable Vincent Dinolfo and his wife have come for this. Thank you, Bill Rylick, the Greece Town Supervisor. Uh, the County Executive, Adam Bello, is here, and Jeff McCann, the Deputy, is here with uh, him. There are many legislators and obviously uh, important people that have uh, given up some time to be here that we want to thank and recognize. A lot of people from our community as well. Um, Nick Stefanovic, where are you, Nick? Thank you for, Nick has been a great help in organizing and putting all of this together. The director of the Veteran Services, uh, Eric Wheeler and Ken Piazza and Dr. Peter Zernowski, uh, all part of the veterans community that have been a part of making this event and putting this together, uh, and a part of Gary's life as well. Jamie Saunders, the president and CEO of the United Way of Greater Rochester, and Laura Stradley, the executive director of the Veterans Outreach, Thank you um, for your help in all of this. Bob Lonsberry uh, came. If you uh, saw on the news, uh, Bob, thank you for writing just a, a wonderful article and obituary to honor the life of Gary, his service to our nation, um, as well as his service to our community, to the church, to his family, and throughout all of that. Of course, we recognize there is a, a great military presence here, many people that have come in uh, for this, police, fire that are here, first responders. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of all of this. And of course, our First Bible Baptist family has come out as well to celebrate the life of Gary Barkirk and to remember him as well. I'm going to ask Captain Dennis Steen. He is the chaplain of the Special Forces. Would you come and join me? Uh, the captain is going to start our service with a prayer this morning. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that your presence would be among us today and give us your perfect peace as we mourn the loss of one of our nation's heroes, Sergeant Gary Bykirk. I'm thankful that our sorrow is turned into rejoicing as we honor Gary and celebrate his life. We celebrate the life of a war hero who fought to save lives and free oppressed people in Vietnam many years ago. We celebrate the life of a loving husband 
and we're thankful for the tremendous love that Gary had for Lolly and for all of his family. Please draw them close to yourself and give them your comfort. We celebrate Gary's life as a cherished friend, mentor, and counselor for countless people as his influence continues to reach deep into this local community and stretches far throughout the world. Most of all, Lord, today we celebrate and honor you, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Gary would wish, we celebrate you because your life made Gary's life possible. You gave him eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ as his Savior, and we rejoice to know that he is in your presence at this very moment and shall be for all eternity. So, Father, during this time of sharing precious memories and celebration, I pray that you would move among us today. Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know Christ as their personal Savior like Gary did and does not have the hope of eternal life through your Son, may they make that life-changing decision today. Thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chaplain. Let me draw your attention to the screen for a short video. beautiful song and reminder for all of us. I would like to invite Colonel Brent Lindemann from the Special Forces to come and join me at this time as he has a message for us. Good morning. 
I'm Colonel Brent Lindemann, commander of the 5th Special Forces Group, and it is a privilege and an honor for us to be included in celebrating Gary's life and his legacy. I did not have a personal relationship with Gary, and I know from spending time with his family and friends yesterday that I missed out. What a blessing that would have been. Gary and I, however, share a strong tribal bond in that we are both Green Berets, and we are more specifically, we are both members of the 5th Special Forces Group. For those of you who may not be as familiar, United States Army Special Forces, more popularly known as the Green Berets, because of our rifle Green Berets that we wear, are a force that is organized, manned, trained, and equipped to conduct special operations with a special focus on unconventional warfare, UW, which may be more simply described as support to resistance forces or freedom fighters, hence our motto, De Oppresso Liber, to free the oppressed. On the other side of unconventional warfare is something that we call foreign internal defense, where we help friendly governments and their militaries to ward off active threats. What is common to both of these missions is that we can't do them ourselves. They are people-oriented. Retired Special Forces Colonel Mark Boyat characterizes the core purpose of Special Forces as working through, by, and with indigenous populations in order to accomplish special activities. And this is what Gary was doing when he was assigned to Operational Detachment Bravo 24 of the 5th Special Forces Group located at Dak Siang. He was working, living, and fighting alongside his Montagnard brothers. Green Berets are passionate, strong, resilient. We like challenges and adventure. We thrive working alone or in small trusted groups. We trend towards being nonconformists by varying degrees. Sometimes this may be perceived as, as uh, having a problem with authority. A lot of us are out of the box thinkers, but mostly we're just really good at applying common sense when others are not. This includes bending the rules a bit when the rules are getting in the way of doing what's right, which again can be perceived as being nonconformist or bucking authority. But that's our tribe. The kind of guys you want at your side in a fight because they'll fight their hearts out for you. And this extends to our indigenous partners who in turn reciprocate our love and our respect by being willing and able to put everything on the line even if it takes that last full measure. And this is what Gary experienced but to an extraordinary degree. He had a heart so big and a love so strong for his teammates that it drove him into harm's way over and over again, and his Montagnard brothers followed. Gary deservedly earned the Medal of Honor for his actions on April 1st, 1970. His portrait and the portraits of 21 other Green Berets who received the Medal of Honor for their actions in Vietnam hang in our headquarters. Their stories are a part of our tribal lore, and we hold these stories as a treasured part of our heritage, and we will tell them in the 5th Special Forces Group for generations to come. And we all know that part of Gary's story is the fact that he lived in a cave, which he returned to even after having received the Medal of Honor. I mean, that is absolutely legend. But the most powerful part of Gary's legacy in our group truly is his example of service, faith, and love. Love for his family, his God, and his fellow man. The 16th of this month will mark the third anniversary of when one of our Green Berets, John, was killed in action in Syria. I spoke with John's wife recently, and she told me about meeting Gary at an event. She was amazed that when they met, Gary recognized her name and knew John's story. She said it was as if Gary had mourned along with Fifth Group when we lost John. She learned later from one of John's teammates in, in the qualification course 
that John had chosen to write a report about Gary during one of the phases of the course. Man, how about that? Gary was an inspiration to both John and his wife at different times in their lives when they needed it. I can say with certainty that Gary will continue to be an inspiration for Green Berets for his conduct on the battlefield, but more importantly for his conduct in life. Gary achieved what we all should hope for, a life that continues to make an impact even after we're gone. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Truly some uh, very accurate words about the life of Gary. He was a genuine influencer, someone that could encourage and impact. And uh, just, uh, I know most of you are here because he has had an impact on your life. I know that's true for me. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Bellow, the county executive, to come and say a few words on behalf of Monroe County at this time. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, good morning. It is really my honor and privilege to be here with all of you this morning representing the residents and the citizens of Monroe County. Humility, faith, love, and family, and fellow man. Compassion, strength, resilience, a hero. These are the words that I would use to describe Gary Bikirk. It has been my honor to have met Gary and to get to know him over the past few years. When I was in Gary's presence, I knew I was in the presence of a remarkable person. His was a life of selflessness and service to God and his community. Most people know Gary as a result of his heroism on the battlefield. But the heroism that resulted in Gary uh, being awarded the Medal of Honor was the start of a lifetime of service to his country and his community. This service included becoming an ordained minister and the chaplain of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. It also included working with veterans suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use disorders. But Gary's biggest impact may have been as a school counselor. There were countless social media comments from former Greece students touched by this remarkable man. I would say that you measure greatness not by material success, but by living a life of significance, making a difference in the lives of others, changing the course of others' lives, and relentlessly putting the good of others ahead of self. That was Gary Bikirk. I would tell someone asking, who was Gary Bikirk? That he was someone that if you were lucky enough to spend time with, you tried to be still and absorb, because there are few in life you meet with such wisdom, compassion, humility, and grace. I would tell them that on the day that we gathered last year to dedicate the Gary Bikirk Memorial Park, the park that includes the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and the new War on Terror Memorial, I wondered how many lives Gary changed for the better, how many lives he saved in battle, how many veterans who were struggling that he provided hope and support. What impact did his wise counsel have on students and our children, and how many lives did he influence to think of something greater than self? It's not often in life that you're in the company of greatness. All of us here today were lucky enough to have had that opportunity. Gary gave me this. It's a challenge coin. And I've been blessed to receive a number of challenge coins over the years, but this one was particularly meaningful to me. Others who have this I think probably feel the same way. It's a daily reminder of the good that we can all do. It's our purpose to live our lives to the fullest, but to leave this world better than we found it. And so I keep this with me. I think he gave it to me because that's what he did, give, and give with no expectation of return. Service, humility, and grace. That is how I would describe Gary Bikirk to someone seeing his name for the first time. So I end with this. I ask all of Monroe County to channel Gary Bikirk, his selflessness and his humility, even if for only a day. Can you imagine such a day? 
imagine how much better we would be as individuals and as a community. And on behalf of a community extraordinarily grateful to have known this great man, to have learned from Gary, and to have received his generosity, I offer our condolences to Gary's family and his friends. God bless Gary, his wife Lolly, his family, and to all those who served our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Very well said. I like those words. You just needed to absorb. You just get into his presence. And uh, if you're around him at all, what he said had a value and weight to it. And I think a lot of those words will be remembered through all of us. I'd ask that you would stand with me. We are going to have a congregational song. As Jake and Izzy lead us here this morning. This past summer, as we sat on Gary's back porch in a homemade worship service, he said, as we sang this song, it's amazing, Grace. If there's anything that brings me joy, it's knowing I'm part of God's plan. I can endure anything if I know it's in God's plan. So we're going to sing Amazing Grace together in honor of Gary.
shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy I'm Pastor Mike Metzger, and I'm the associate pastor here, and I've been a friend of Gary's for over 40 years. And uh, I've worked with him since July to plan this memorial service, and so this is all what he wanted. And so we praise the Lord for that. And uh, we have some time of remembrance called eulogies that we're going to have some people speak to you and share some things about Gary and his life. And the first one I'm going to invite is Nick Stefanovic, who's uh, head of the Veterans Service Agency. So Nick, come on up, buddy. Appreciate it. Nick has been a blessing to me in helping me organize this, and he is truly a, a good friend of the family, too. Nick? Good morning. Standing here at this podium today, being asked to speak about Sergeant Gary Bykirk is and will be uh, the honor of my life. I have written, deleted, and rewritten this multiple times. Gary shared life-changing experiences with thousands of people, many in this room. We all have stories about him. We can all remember the moment that he changed the way we thought about our values, philosophies, and perspective. I'm humbled to have been asked to share with you today and even more so filled with gratitude that I was lucky enough to have shared time on this earth with a man who I believe embodies the definition of being too good for this world. I had a unique relationship with Gary. He actually found me. I serve as a Marine who joined shortly after 9-11, I spent most of my operational time in Afghanistan. I came home confused and angry, tormented. As I slowly began to transition more into society, I began bumping into Gary at events. We became acquaintances, but I knew that he was unique in regard to his presence when he would approach me, often with the Medal of Honor around his neck, and ask, how are you doing? First, I was speechless, simply being in the presence of that medal. I understood the cost of that medal. But after that, I recognized that when Gary asked how you were doing, he did so with these piercing eyes that I knew always saw more than what I presented and a tone of voice that conveyed that he really actually wanted to know how I was doing. 
I avoided sharing anything with anyone at that time in my life, so I deflected his attempts to reach me by simply replying, I'm doing good, Gary. He would do this half smile, and then he waited to see if I was going to say anything else. It would be an awkward few moments, and then I would make some type of small talk to shift his attention away from me. After we spent more time together and became friends, he one day called me and said, I needed to meet him at Tim Hortons on Long Pond Road. <clears throat> and there he trapped me in a booth early on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Gary knew on all those occasions that I was never doing good. He confronted me in a way only Gary knew how to do, with a sincere and genuine love but also with a relentless determination to find the truth and then start healing. I gave up my demons to Gary on that day. He was one of the first. He started out by saying, I know you're not good. After that, it's hard for me to explain how the conversation went. I spilled out my darkness that had been haunting me for a decade, and he seemed to grab it and absorb it into him. I asked him how he could experience what he did and still believe in God with such resolve. He did that half smile again, and then shared with me some of the greatest lessons I would ever witness as a man. Gary taught me that war is the most precious experience that I will ever have. It's a very intimate, passionate, exhilarating, and horrific experience. Unfortunately, war is a part of humanity. It will exist in some form in some part of the globe always. But according to Gary, War, for those of us that have experienced the battlefield, is not about death. It's about life. He taught me that we went to war out of love, and that there does not exist a stronger love than that which is exhibited on the battlefield. Gary learned what it means to truly love another human being from a 15-year-old Vietnamese boy, who had he not become a Green Beret and traveled across the globe to fight in Vietnam, he would never have even known. A boy who loved Gary so much that as it became clear a mortar round was about to impact directly on top of their location, without a second thought would throw his body over Gary's to absorb the concussion and shrapnel so that Gary might live and continue to save other villagers and soldiers. That 15-year-old warrior gave his life in that moment so that others might live. Gary taught me that in order to truly live, you must know death. I was young, but I knew death. He said to me that life has a meaning the protected will never know. He asked me what I felt for the men that I went to war with. I told him, there are no words that do justice to the love I have for them. And he said, you see, what a gift. I asked what any of it mattered now that I was surrounded by people who don't have the capacity to understand these things. And he said, what makes you think people around you don't have the capacity to understand love? We continue this conversation over the years, and Gary taught me the value of purpose. He taught me that while those around me might not understand the nature of war, it does not mean that they can't see the value in the love that we had for each other, whether it was in the highlands of Vietnam or the Cornegal Valley in Afghanistan. We can't squander that gift. Today, because of Gary, I understand how easy it is to mix up what is significant and what is insignificant. We live in a world where information is flying at us from every direction as we consume the constant barrage of media and hang on every word and feel as if every turn of events is the most important thing in our lives, all these things that 10 years from now we won't even remember. As a combat veteran and a friend of Gary Pikerks, I can say with great confidence that significant in today's social discourse is relative. The way in which we relate and treat one another is significant. The final words that Gary spoke to me before he became very ill were sent in the form of a text message. It reads as follows. Good morning, Nick. Sitting here in our sunroom enjoying the sun prompted me to give thanks for the many blessings God gives that often go unnoticed. Sunshine, good air to breathe, order in a world that at any moment could spin into chaos. Then I began to pray for items that God brings to my heart. You and your family were brought to me. I wanted you to know that at this moment in Western New York, a friend was bringing you to the Lord. 
I love you, my brother. I have enjoyed our time together and the words we shared. You are a warrior and have knowledge about love, about caring for others more than self. To those who fight for it, life has a meaning the protective might never know, but they need to know it. They need the wisdom life and war have taught us. Who will teach them about loving others more than self, if not us who have fought and died because we loved another more than self? Thank you, Nick. At this time, I'm going to invite Sharni Buckley to come. It is Gary's sister-in-law and Lolly's sister. Sharni? Good morning. It is an absolute pleasure to be asked to speak here. It is probably the most important words I'll ever say. And as many of you know, I'm a talker. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Speech, glasses, picture, focal point. You always have to have a focal point of something beautiful in front of you when you speak. Okay. Where do I start? Let's see. He's been in my life since I was 17. He spoke at my high school graduation in 1976, bicentennial year. He married my husband and I. He baptized me as an adult. It would be impossible to encompass it all. I always told people, Gary Bykirk is someone worth getting to know. If you knew him, you loved him. We as family and friends are blessed to know that we have our own personal slideshow of memories that we can play, we can pause, and we can rewind. How do you begin to talk about a man whose contributions have been unmeasurable? Like the number of stars in the sky, we don't know how many, but what we do know is that Gary is now one of those beautiful, bright stars. He touched the lives of so many with his love, his faith, his compassion, and his incredible ability to listen. He made us feel as though we mattered. His gentleness created a wave that gave us the capability to allow things to come into our hearts and minds that made us think. He was a source of lifelong inspiration. He was always willing to help. There's too many in my life to share with you. I would have page upon page upon page. But one of my favorites, and I tell everybody this story who'll listen. I can remember asking him to write me a reference letter in regards to a job that I really wanted to land. I said, just write me a couple of paragraphs, just nothing fancy, just something simple. Needless to say, what I got was an eloquently written letter, the only way he knew how, full page. Needless to say, I landed that job. Even in the last few weeks of his life, he still wanted to give of himself. Snippets of power God moments were during casual living room conversation. His art of giving back in full display. His willpower was evidence of just how strong this man was. Gary heard us talking about my son who had just recently got engaged. He was determined that he needed to make a gift. His soft voice was very articulate. He said, it needs to be two pieces. It needs to be two pieces of different wood. He sat at the dining room table and drew the project he wanted to create. His hand was incredibly steady. <clears throat> As we walked the living room, 
he looked up near the hall tree and he said, we even could do something here. He goes, that would be so nice, wouldn't it? A gesture so pure, your heart skipped a beat. He had the unique ability to relate, to connect and create an atmosphere of comfort with everyone he met. He would talk no differently to a parking lot attendant or to the CEO of the parking car garage. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for allowing us to be a part of your life. Because of you, we are better people. We are more forgiving. We are less critical of others. We are not as judgmental. We are better focused. We are more patient. We are more understanding. We are more giving. We have a better outlook on life. And we are far better people because of you. I heard someone say recently, Gary not only belonged to his family, but he also belonged to the world. I believe he now belongs with Jesus, and he is dancing with our King. Lolly and Gary, thank you for showing us that true love really does exist. We love you, Gary by Kirk. We always have, and we always will. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Kate Umstetter, who's Gary's granddaughter, and she's going to bring some of the other grandchildren and introduce them to you. So, Kate, come on up. And they'll all have an hour speech. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Use that microphone. Little kids on. Good morning. You guys good? Okay. Papa was many things to many people. A war hero, a counselor. But although my time up here is going to be brief, I'd like to tell you just a few facts about what he was like as our Papa. Every one of his birthdays, he brought all 14 of us to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Each Easter, he would hide eight eggs per 14 grandchildren. So that's 112 Easter eggs hidden around his backyard. Uh, every Christmas, he would pick out, pick out an ornament that would represent our year as a gift to keep. And he would plan minute to win it games for the family to play together. I could go on forever. But we have a few kids from each of the families that would like a turn. First, I'll invite Liz and Tim from Sarah's family. Second, my sister from Stephanie's family. And lastly, Maddie from Stephen's family. Oh, okay. Gary Bikirk has many titles, Green Beret, Medal of Honor recipient, guidance counselor, friend. I knew him as Papa. When I was younger, he was a person, like Katie just said, who would hide the Easter eggs. I would get $20 in a Christmas card every year along with my ornament. And there was this treasure box where he was the keeper of it. Anytime you wanted to get into the treasure box that was filled with candy, you had to say the special words. All of us know them. It's, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me. Every single time. So that is forever drilled into my head because of what him and Nana did there. Um, that was Papa. As I got older, I started to realize all the cool things that he ended up doing in the war, how he dodged bullets and bombs, or at least most of them, um, <laughs> and how he lived in a cave for a while. Like, nobody does that. That's, that's insane. And I remember any time, any, like, any chance I had to bring it up in a conversation with anyone, I would. He was my favorite person to brag about. The thing is, he never bragged about it himself. Like, I have a tattoo on my shoulder, to really live, you must almost die, which it was already explained a little bit, but like, I love talking about him. But whenever he told me about his stories, it was never I dodged these bullets or I like got through these bombs, I got out of the cave. It was God got me through this. God brought Nana there to get him out of the cave. It was never I did this myself. And as I go over, 
I can't, I can't even go to Wegmans without someone coming up. Like, the influence he has had on so many people, I had to share my papa, which was amazing because there was so much for him to give. Um, he survives through all the people he's influenced after all this time following God on earth. He is finally at peace with the Savior. And it's honestly our turn now to continue what we started and to live for God's honor as he would want us to. So. Some of you may know Gary Bikirk as Sergeant Gary Bikirk, Medal of Honor recipient. Others may know him as Mr. B, guidance counselor and teacher. But I know him as Papa. I know him as the man who would take me out for my birthday every year and take every single one of us out for their birthdays every year um, and, and would take me shopping uh, for whenever I needed clothes for a banquet or an event. Shopping with Nana and Papa was always fun. Um, Papa, hey Tim, you want this? Nana, no, he doesn't need it. It's fine. <laughs> um, or they just wanted to take me out shopping. I knew him as the man who would care for his family wherever there was a need. If there was a perfect role model in my life as to what a man of God should be, Papa was that role model. One of the biggest life lessons that he taught me was to live a life of significance. Living a life of significance is far greater than living a life of success. Success is temporary. It'll all go away at some point. But living a life of significance, personally impacting someone's life and loving on someone will leave a lasting effect. Papa's life is evident of that. No matter where he went and no matter what he did, he always wanted to do it out of love. He always wanted to show the love of Christ to everyone he came into contact with. He truly showed what loving others as Jesus loved others should look like. And now he gets to experience that love of Jesus face to face. Papa ran his, ra his race well and finished it well. You now get to rest, Papa. I love you and miss you. Strength of character, remembrance, faithfulness, and moral integrity. I cannot think of any words better to describe the man that my papa was. These words also happen to be the meaning behind the gladiolus flower, the birth month flower for August in which my papa was born. It is said that these sword-shaped flowers were meant to pierce the heart of each recipient, which is exactly what my papa did when he spoke to anyone that he knew. My Papa, a true man of God, was absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit. And he put on that armor of God each day to pierce every heart that he encountered with the sword of the Spirit, using every chance he had to spread the word of God. It was an absolute privilege to be blessed with him as my Papa, a privilege only myself and only my cousins could ever truly understand. He pierced my own heart each time he spoke to me, and he inspired me since I was a child with the way that he chose to use his words. I would always look forward to hearing what he would say before each holiday together when he would sit all of us grandkids down and tell us a message to bring meaning and purpose to each holiday. Every single year, he took extra time to pour into us in these special moments that I now will replay in my mind every single day. I pray that when he looks down on me, that he sees me living my life with strength of character, remembrance, faithfulness, and moral integrity for his honor. Thank you. Anyone who knew my grandpa knows he had a way with words. It was a gift, really, the way he was able to mesmerize and captivate an audience in the way that he did. I must have listened to him give hundreds of speeches over the years. I've heard the story so many times that I can recite his Medal of Honor citation verbatim just from memory. Yet every time he spoke, it was like hearing it all for the first time. In sixth grade, he used to drive me to school every morning and then pick me up in the afternoons. In the morning, he would tell me stories of his life as we moved through 7 a.m. traffic. In the afternoons, we took the scenic route, driving alongside the lake and on winding cliff roads. Sometimes he would point out a specific area and tell me a story about something that had happened there when he was younger. And other times we would just enjoy the scenery. 
taking in the changing colors of the leaves or the way the snow fell over the vast expanse of frozen Lake Ontario. Papa always made time for me. He would talk to me about anything and everything. He would answer my endless questions, indulge my latest strange obsession or complex existential theory, and smile at me in a way that told me he was truly listening. Because for as good of a speaker as he was, he was an even better listener. His existence was warm, soft, and comforting. He made the world a better place just by being there. I will forever carry him with me in my heart. I would like to close with a poem that has given me some comfort these couple of weeks. When I was leaving your funeral, church bells sang announcing another hour of my life. Another hour lived without you. Birds chirped and I heard a sprinkler spraying water on grass already too green for its own good. It would have been a great day if it wasn't already the worst day of my life. Across from the church was a playground. Children swung on the swings and tuned to the bells. A child's eyes met mine. They were warm, welcoming. Not only was life still going on, it was still smiling at me. Alicia Cook. I miss you so much, Papa. I love you. This time, um, we're going to watch a video of Marcus Brotherton, who was the author of Gary's book. They worked together, and uh, he couldn't be here. He got COVID at the last minute, and so he gave us a video that is very powerful. So listen to Marcus Brotherton. Four years ago, I reached out to Gary Bikrick, absolutely cold, and my message said in part, hi. My name is Marcus Brotherton. A friend told me about your story. It's absolutely incredible. I write books for a living, and I wonder if you'd like to explore the possibility of doing a book with me about your life. Well, two days later, Gary wrote back, and he said, Marcus, your email may be an answer to a prayer that my wife and I have had for a number of years. As we've shared our story at events across the country, we've often been asked if we have ever written a book. I've tried a number of times to write my story, or at least part of it. The only result has been a small booklet titled For His Honor. It took me 20 years to write that, <laughs> but it contains a truth that's always been at the core of any message I would like to write. God has allowed me to wear the Medal of Honor, not for anything I have done, but for God's honor, to allow me the opportunity to share His love with others. Well, Gary said yes to writing a full book, and over the next two years, Gary and I worked to prepare the manuscript. We had countless interviews. We researched extensively. We met in person. We had meals together. Gary met my family, and later he sent challenge coins to my children, which they thoroughly enjoyed receiving. In 2019, after reading the completed manuscript for the first time before it was published, Gary emailed me saying, What you have written reflects how God has enabled us to work together. There are many times that as memories come back to me, tears come with them, but by God's grace, those tears have been transformed from tears of pain and sadness into tears of praise and thankfulness. Well, finally, our book was completed and scheduled for release. It's titled Blaze of Light, and one of the keys to a successful book launch is to have lots and lots of publicity lined up, and we did. We had TV interviews scheduled, as well as a string of book signings across the country. People were excited to have this book come out. The launch date has proved key. Our book was scheduled for release on March 24th, 2020. Hindsight has shown that in the history of printing, literally, there has never been a worse month to release a book than March 2020. COVID hit. The country shut down. We couldn't get in the news cycle. Bookstores were closed. All of our signings were canceled. Well, Gary, ever affable, ever full of faith, Gary sent an email to the publishing team which said in part, I'm joining you in prayers for the book and for the health of all and that the Spirit of God would bring His peace and healing to everyone. One silver lining with lockdown, he wrote, <laughs> he said, 
at least now I'll be able to get some work done. Well, copies of Blaze of Light went out slowly, but they did go out. And shortly after the release, Gary emailed, emailed me saying, I wish I could share with you every email message and phone call we have received lately. People are reading the book and they can't put it down. They're telling their friends about it. Ultimately, they describe how they are being brought closer to God through this book. That is exactly why Lolly and I wanted to tell our story. Well, eventually we received some traction for the book and Gary and I stayed in touch. We continued to email and talk on the phone and regretfully, Gary told me that the cancer had returned. We sorrowed together. Sometimes we called each other simply to pray. In one of the last emails I sent to Gary, I wrote these words, Gary, I've been drawing strength lately from Psalm 16. Perhaps it will encourage you as well. It reads, O Lord, you make known to me the pathway of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Gary wrote back saying, Marcus, my health is in God's hands. Each day now is a gift. And oh, that psalm you mentioned, it's one of my favorites. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. I'd like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Doug Herman to be here. He was deployed to Saudi Arabia and Gary had asked him to come and he said, I don't think I can make it. And the Lord worked it all out for him to come from Saudi Arabia. So it's an honor to have you here, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. This is not only the theme verse for this eulogy to Gary Bykirk, but more importantly, it was the verse Gary and Lolly selected to be their theme verse on their wedding day, Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1975. Thank you, Lolly, for sharing that verse with us and how you and Gary happened upon that verse as you opened the Bible for a photo on your wedding day. The amazing, selfless, purpose-driven love for God, love for his wife, love for his family, love for his country, love for those around him, and valor above the, and beyond the call of duty are the hallmarks of the life of Gary Bykirk that we are honoring here today at the church where Gary and Lolly worshiped for several years. Myself, along with all of you here today, have been touched by this humble war hero and recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's the highest award the U.S. government can bestow upon a U.S. military service member for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of one's own life beyond the call of duty. Gary has left a lasting legacy that we can all learn from and be inspired by. And yet, the way he has impacted us amazingly goes much deeper than the Medal of Honor. Family and friends, fellow veterans, and service members, former students of Greece Central Schools, and distinguished guests, thank you all for being here today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Doug Herman. I was born right here, uh, raised nearby in Greece, New York. Like the rest of you here, my life has also been significantly impacted by the life, love, and wisdom of Gary Bykirk. Once I got to know him and learned the story of his selfless acts of valor in Vietnam that resulted in Sergeant Gary Bykirk being awarded the Medal of Honor, I knew that if I didn't serve my country, even for a short few years of enlistment, I would regret it the rest of my life. Over 21 years later, I have no regrets, and Gary's life lessons have had an indelible impact on my spiritual life, my marriage, my family, and my military career. I bet if we 
I would be, we would all be amazed if we could see a show of hands here today for those that have been personally encouraged or counseled directly or indirectly by Gary in ways that have impacted your life in significant ways as well. Or for some of you, just think back to some times when you were just listening or observing Gary as he was led by God to interact with someone who needed his genuine care, concern, and wisdom. That was Gary's calling in life. He was devoted to reaching out to his generation of Vietnam veterans, as well as the current generation of veterans who share in the struggle to heal from the physical and emotional wounds of war. He was a master of connecting with people. Yet ironically, that was the very thing he wrestled with the most in those early years after Vietnam. Even while seeking to grow in his faith as a seminary student in New Hampshire, he opted to live in a cave in the woods for nearly two years in an attempt to keep a safe distance from people. That was until Lolly came into the picture. I remember bits and pieces of the story, but Marcus Brotherton does the best job in Blaze of Light, the book about Gary's life story, capturing the details about how Lolly and Gary met. It all happened in Lancaster, New Hampshire, the same town where he was attending uh, White Mountain Seminary. The story goes that Lolly would leave sweet notes for Gary at the seminary mailroom, but he hesitated to respond. Not just after the first note and the second note, but several notes. <laughs> he was unsure if he knew how to respond or if he was even ready to engage in any relationship. Now, if you know this story and you know Gary, it's hard to imagine that he was so reluctant to at least say hello to Lolly. I remember reading this part of Gary and Lolly's story, of their love story, thinking, Gary, come on, man, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Thank God the two of them finally bumped into each other in the town uh, laundromat where Gary finally said hello. It didn't take long for them to fall in love and marry in just a few short uh, months later. And yes, as we know, this did force Gary to move out of that cave. <laughs> Gary and Lolly had a significant impact on my wife and I through our dating, our engagement, and even Gary serving to preside over our wedding ceremony. I will never forget one point where Gary and Lolly emphasized in our pre-marriage counseling in a nutshell, they emphasized that when the conflicts in marriage come, and they most certainly will, it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. All that matters is that Jesus is right. My wife and I, along with, I guarantee, countless others here today, are blessed for embracing that wisdom. Make no mistake, Gary would be the first one to tell you how much God has blessed his life Look at the beautiful life he and Lolly lived together. How much we can see that God was glorified in their marriage. If you've watched some of the local news interviews lately about Gary, you can see how much God has blessed Gary and Lolly with a warm, genuine, down-to-earth loving family, and quite a large family at that. Three children, 14 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild, all of whom love him dearly. Their loving kids, Stephanie, along with her husband, Bob, Stephen, Sarah, along with her husband, Andy, Gary and Lolly's wonderful grandchildren that you saw, Caitlin Umsetter and her husband, Gary, Mallory, James, and Phoebe Zimmerly, Annabelle, Elizabeth, Timothy, Joseph, Esther, Levi, and Lydia Hines, and Madeline, Reagan, and Garrett Bykirk, and most recently, their great-grandson, Noah Umsetter. Gary made it clear to us, to us all uh, that being awarded the Medal of Honor has been a tremendous blessing in his life. For those who have had, heard Gary's story firsthand or have had the opportunity to hear about the heroic acts of val valor during the siege of Camp Dak Son, Vietnam, you can easily spend hours pondering how he pushed himself to save a multitude of lives while he himself was nearly mortally wounded, temporarily paralyzed, yet giving every ounce of strength that he had by any means possible to render aid to the wounded 
while under the hail of gunfire and rocket blasts. One might be tempted to conclude that this is the sum of what defines the epitome of a strong, real man. But we know that this was only a part of what shaped this man, who God would use to bless hundreds, no, more likely thousands of people. In my recent conversation with Gary's daughter, Stephanie, it was beautiful to hear her recall how she grew up watching Gary grow. She vividly remembers his time of needing to heal from his experience in Vietnam, moving from not feeling worthy of the Medal of Honor to God revealing to him that he wanted to use his experiences, some of the most challenging a human being can endure, and the Medal of Honor as a way to reach others who needed not only his compassionate listening ear, but most importantly, the love of Jesus Christ. Stephanie, along with her siblings, her mom, the grandkids, and all of us have recognized that Gary was the epitome of what a real man should be all about. It's not about how tough or macho you can be. On the contrary, what we have learned from Gary is that true manliness is measured, measured in how selflessly you love others. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17 reads, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, although we once regarded Christ in that same way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Of all the painful memories Gary wrestled with from the siege of Camp Daxon, there was one moment that seemed to change everything. The moment his Montagnard battle buddy, Deo, who helped carry him so he could continue to fight and treat casualties while still under fire, Deo gave the full measure of selflessness, shielding Gary from a blast with his body that took his own life but saved Gary's. John 15 verse 3 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down their life for his friends. God used Deo's sacrifice to help bring Gary to a deep understanding of how much God so loves the world that he would give his one and only son, Jesus, to sacrifice his own life for our sake so that each of us who put our trust in the Son of God may live forever in the very presence of our Heavenly Father. And that, my friends, is the heart of what I know compelled Gary to spend countless hours and days over the past several decades traveling and speaking to groups large and small about how God had taught him the difference between a life spent pursuing significance versus just success. Gary urged us to understand that there is something more important in life than just yourself. He taught us what it means to die to yourself, that helping others is what life is all about. He acknowledged that living for others can be a battle, but it is one worth fighting for. Gary and Lolly, his greatest battle buddy, fought cancer together for 10 years. Gary knew that his, his battle with cancer was in God's hands. He wanted to spend his days fighting to live every day with purpose, honoring the lessons learned from Deo in Vietnam about living to love others more than himself versus just surviving and living for personal success. Gary reminded us that while it's normal to want to be successful in life, there is a huge difference between a successful life and a life of significance. Gary learned about the joy of earning mutual trust with others, the blessing of making a difference in the lives of others. He also learned that cancer was trying to get him to focus on himself, to feel sorry for himself. So he fought that inclination, driven by lessons from his Montagnard buddies in Vietnam, driven by the love of his wife, the love of family and friends, driven by the love of Christ that compelled him. He reminded us that surviving and personal success says, I made it. But significant says, we made it. 
Gary prayed for all of us that we would know that we were created by God for a purpose, that none of us are here by accident. We were created to live a life with a mission to love others more than ourselves. Thank you, God, for the gift of this humble man who you used to bless all of us. He was the ultimate example of Christ-likeness. Thank you, Gary, for your love. Thank you for leaving us with priceless wisdom for living and urging us to humbly embrace God's forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Thank you for drawing along, alongside so many of us, sticking closer than a brother as we wrestled with our own hurts, pains, and shortcomings, showing us that we too can experience God's amazing grace and peace that passes all human understanding. Thank you for encouraging us to fight our internal battles with the love of Christ and to resist the inclination to live for ourselves when living sacrificially for others is what brings joy in our journey. In closing, I will conclude with the words Gary had printed on the back of his personalized card with his portrait painted by Jim Nelson printed on the front. You've all heard the saying, to really live, you must, you must almost die. To those who fight for it, life has a meaning the protected may never know. I pray that through the chaos and battles of life, you may find meaning in the love and peace of God through the cross of Jesus Christ. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I to the world. Galatians 6:14. May God richly bless you, Sergeant Gary Biker, Medical Aid Men, 5th Special Forces Group, U.S. Army, Congressional Medal of Honor, Vietnam, 1969 to 1970. We love you, Gary. You were the most loving brother, friend, battle buddy, mentor, counselor, chaplain, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and husband anyone could ask for. God bless the entire Bikirk family. God bless all of you for being part of Gary's celebration of life, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to invite the family to come. They're going to sing a song for us. song is called There You'll Be.
to feel the sky within my reach And I always will remember all the strength you gave to me Your love made me make it through Oh, I owe so much to you I'm going to invite uh, Pastor George Grace to come and uh, his message for us. One of the things that Gary said is um, to Pastor Grace, he said, uh, I want you to do the message when the, my funeral is. He said, only in one condition, that you read my book. <laughs> and so he read his book, and so he's able to do this today. Pastor Grace. Thank <laughs> you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you on behalf of Gary's family and all of Gary's friends. Thank you for being here today. And uh, I want you to know this right up front. I'm going to say something and bear with me until I'm done. I want you to know that Gary, although he certainly uh, would agree with much of what has been said, he wouldn't have had it this way. If everyone told Gary that at your funeral, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about you and what a great person you would be, he would say, nah, we're not going to do that at my funeral. And we've heard a lot of that today, and rightly so. There certainly are things that uh, have been said that he would agree with, his relationship with God and how important various things, values in his life were. And uh, we've learned, his grandchildren have learned well from that. Many of us have learned well from that for being with him and his friend. But I want you to know that much of what has been said about him would uh, not have been said if he had it his way today. But the reason why I'm speaking is for this reason. Because he told me what to say. So I'm going to tell you what he told me to say. And I would not dare not tell you what he told me to say because I believe someday that I will have to face him in heaven. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I could handle the tongue lashing. 
I'm not even sure he could give anybody a tongue lashing. But if he would give somebody a tongue lashing, it would be me for wasting this moment for you. My name is Pastor George Grace, and I pastored this church as the senior pastor for 33 and a half years. Gary has been a member of this church for many years, and I was his pastor for decades. Not only his pastor, but his friend. In fact, uh, you heard Mike say that I had to read his book before I could do this. Well, I went back in my calendar to see when we talked, and it was, I believe, April 30th of last year that I visited with Gary in his home. And uh, I just went there for a visit because he's a church member and a friend of mine and all that. But it was at that meeting that he said, a Pastor, Lolly and I have talked about this, and we want you to do my memorial service, to preach at my memorial service. And, of course, he looked pretty good then, and I thought, well, maybe, Gary, you'll have to do my memorial service. You know, you look, I think, better than I do right now. But anyway, uh, he gave me that commission. That was at the end of April. He said, but <clears throat> I'm not going to allow you to do that if you don't read my book. Now, we talked about marketing. That was, mar that was his marketing technique, to get me to spend the 20 or 25 bucks to actually that's not true he gave me the book in fact on the inside cover it says to George pastor friend brother in arms brother in Christ for his honor Gary and Lolly one of the things I'm sure that um, helped join the two of us together, not just being a church member, but uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran myself of United States Marine Corps, and uh, so I understand a little bit of the things that he went through, although my experience uh, in Vietnam was very, very different, and I just want to be honest, he speaks so kindly of those people. My experience, and I wasn't a Christian at this time, I escaped Vietnam, that's the way I looked at it, and people often ask me, do you want to go back? And I said, mm, nope, not interested. And uh, I'm getting a little softer now. I might go back now, but it was not a good experience. My experience in the organization uh, with the Marine Corps, I was with a line company. I really didn't have firsthand um, relationship with Vietnamese people. All the Vietnamese people, in a sense, were my enemies. So that was a different uh, perspective as a Marine in a uh, rifle company in Vietnam. But anyway, I say that because I'd always listened to Gary and read in his book about his uh, love for the mountain yards and his love for uh, Vietnamese people and all that. And frankly, I had a very difficult time identifying with that. And I knew I was wrong and he was right. That even made it more difficult for me. I knew he was right. Well, anyway, let me pray with you. Lord, I want to represent uh, you, first of all. I want to represent Gary and Lolly and their family. And Lord, the, this church and your word and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, help me to do that in these few moments we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I'm going to say is not all brand new. Much has been said. In fact, we could put an amen on uh, the, the lieutenant colonel's um, eulogy, and we would have been to church today, I guarantee you that. He had a wonderful eulogy and brought much of the spiritual nature of Gary's relationship out at that time. One thing he said was this. He said, and he quoted John chapter 15 that says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So as I begin right now, I want to honor those of you in Gary's name who have put your life on the line, whether it's been military, firefighters, police officers, first responders, whatever it is on behalf of Gary, I want, and I know he was this way, I was in his presence when he honored other people like that, I want you to know you are honored individuals. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, who said that? Jesus Christ said that. And 
laying down one's life, Jesus Christ is the number one example. He laid down his life for his friends. And so what Christ-likeness is all about is an individual who is willing to put his or her life on the line for other people. That's what Christ-likeness, that's what true love is really all about. Gary was, in my estimation, what I would call a grace and truth kind of guy. He was very soft-spoken. I was in counseling situations with Gary on several occasions, and people would come to me because of my experience with PTSD, and they thought that I could help them, but I wasn't nearly as patient and loving and kind as Gary was, and as experienced as Gary was. So when people would come to me and I felt that I was not getting even halfway to first base, I'd say, would you sit down with Gary Bykirk? And they would always say, yeah, well, I'll do that. Of course, they just want to get to meet him. Well, I'd sit in those um, counseling sessions and I'd listen to Gary and how he dealt with these individuals. And he was so kind and so patient and so compassionate and so loving. And I could go on and on and on. And he taught me over and over how to deal with people in that kind of a stressful situation. He was a grace and truth. He never compromised the truth. He always told the truth. But he did it in such a graceful manner. And again, speaking of Christ, Jesus, the Bible says in John chapter 1, was full of grace and truth. Gary is a wonderful example of Christ-likeness. Maybe the greatest example that I have ever met or known in my life. This is Gary's message. As I go to the Bible and I look in the Old Testament, there's five reasons to have a memorial service. One is the eulogies that's been accomplished. Another is, for the Christian, is it says that the day of a man's death is better than the day of a man's birth. So that has been accomplished. You say, well, how so? Because the day of Gary's death, from God's perspective, was the best day of his life. You can only understand that from God's perspective. From the human perspective, we grieve. We're filled with sorrow, and rightly so. Because to the degree that you love, you lose. And that's humanity. But the Bible says that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's Psalm 116, verse 15. The best day of Gary Bykirk's life was the day he went home to be with the Lord. Don't forget that. He doesn't regret that. At this. He regrets not being with his family. His family regrets not being with him. There's a loss there for a brief period of time, but they will be reunited again. But the third reason for a memorial service is this. It says in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it says, the living will lay it to his heart. In other words, when we come together for memorial service, this isn't just to talk about Gary and what Gary did. We have done that, and rightfully so. But it's all about you. It's all about us. This is what this memorial service is all about. It's about us. Because the living will lay it to his heart. By the way, someday you will die. I'm a prophet, I know that. So will I. Let me ask you this. What will they say at your memorial service? You better get working on it right now. Don't wait another day. Get working on it. Do you have a life like a Gary Bykirk life? Do you have that? Get working on it. Now I want to say this. This is what Gary would tell you. God has a plan and purpose for this world, in this world. And it is the redemption of mankind. Simply put, you could take the whole Bible and sum it up in this statement. Creation, fall, and restoration or forgiveness. That's what the Bible is all about. 
The Bible is all about the fact that man is, has been created by God in the image of God, and man has fallen. We are all sinners, everybody in here, even Gary. Listen, and I want you to know, read his book. He admits that in here. He wasn't always the guy that we're talking about here this morning, and he wasn't embarrassed to tell us who he really was until Jesus came into his life. Creation, fall, redemption. That's what the Bible's all about. We have been created by God. We all have an opportunity and not necessarily an equal opportunity in this life. We know that. Not everybody has the same accesses, the same abilities, the, the various blessings in life. It, the Bible doesn't promise that life is fair. It doesn't promise that. I hear people, my children would say that, oh, dude, life ain't fair. Wake up. It's about time you realize that. Life isn't fair. It isn't fair, but we all have to figure out how to negotiate, navigate the problems of life. What will the living lay to his heart? That we are mortal, subject to death. That it is appointed once to die, and after this the judgment. That life can be seen as one great opportunity to get to meet and to know and to worship God. That's what life is all about. To get to know to meet and to worship God. Creation, I've been created by God. I am a fallen, broken individual. I am a sinner saved by the amazing grace we sang about a little bit ago. And it's all about redemption. Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins so I could be made acceptable and holy to him. And the Bible says, Greater love, as I said, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for you and for me so that we could be forgiven of our sins. That's what the Bible is all about. Someone says, but Pastor Grace, you know, I keep the commandments. Okay, really? Do you keep this one? Here's a commandment. This is the greatest commandment in the Bible. This is what Jesus said. Try this one on for size. Love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole mind, and thy whole strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How about that one? You keep that one? I don't. I haven't. I'm still struggling with that one. But keeping the commandments does not save you. What saves you is the precious blood of Christ that was spilled on Calvary's cross to pay for our sin, for the sin of all mankind. Creation, I'm his creation. I am fallen, I am broken. And Christ died on the cross to redeem me, to pay for my sin. We are all sinners by nature. We are all sinners because we have broken God's laws. We are sinners because we have rejected God's way and turned to our own way. We are sinners because we have come short of God's holy standard. We are sinners and condemned without hope in ourselves. If you're just hoping in yourself, you're condemned and lost. And to believe the gospel of Christ is to believe the truth about you. You're a sinner. You're broken. Now there's a lot of important people in here. A lot of important, much more important peop people than, than me. The only reason I'm important right now is because I'm doing what Gary asked me to do. That's why I'm important. We got politicians in here. We've got military people. We've got Medal of Honor recipients. We've got people in here that I highly respect. I'm not worthy to tie your shoes but Gary wants you to know something that was the most important thing to him in his life. God created us. We are broken. We have fallen. And Christ died on the cross to redeem. If you can be believe, if you believe that you can be saved by your own way, then you are on your own. Hello. Did you hear what I said? If you can be saved yourself on your own way, but whatever a group or idea, the ideology you've concocted in your mind, you are on your own. But Jesus said this, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Pretty arrogant statement if it isn't true. If it is true, you better listen very carefully. I've heard a lot about Jesus here today. He seems to be highly respected in this environment. He said, I am the way. It's not about religion, people. It's not about where you attend church or where your membership is or all of the traditions that your particular denomination goes through. It's not about that. It's about him. He's the way. And you're a sinner, and he paid for your sins. Duh, can we make it any simpler? It's so simple. So simple. I witnessed shared this with a lady two days ago in the hospital who's dying. And I went through this and she told me some stories and what she was, and I said, this is so simple, Karen. This is so simple. And she looked at me and she said, Pastor, I'm the one that's making this complicated, aren't I? Yes! (laughs) This isn't complicated. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin. Now, how do I get that payment applied to me? Faith and repentance. Let's switch that. Repentance and faith. What is repentance? I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I'm sorry I've offended God. I'm sorry that I've done what I've done to offend a holy God, my creator. I'm so sorry. Number two, and I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. God manifest in the flesh. God came to die on that cross to pay for my sins, and he paid for all of them. And if I repent of my sin and put my faith in him alone and call upon his name and ask him to forgive me and save me, he will save me. I believe that. Fifty years ago, I prayed a prayer like that. I was a lost man, Vietnam veteran, changed a lot of my views in my life going to Vietnam and coming home. But somebody got a hold of me with the gospel of Christ and I listened and I said, yeah, I'm a creation of God. Am I broken? Nobody has to tell me that I'm a sinner. What's the way out? Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the only way out. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So, what do you have to do? How does one receive the gospel? How do you get forgiven? How do you get salvation? How does it come? Let's get rid of the religious stuff that confuses people, that Karen was so confused with. You are a creation of God. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to come by faith to him and trust him with a repentant, humble attitude and say, I'm a sinner. I need you. You are the only way. I can't do it my way. And I'm asking you to forgive me and save me and give me the gift of eternal life when I die. And I know I'm going to die. And so are you. And at that day, what have you believed? Have you repented? Have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? I said there's five things. Five things in that, those verses. We've covered three. The last two are very quick. Number four is that sorrow is better than laughter. For by... This, by our, sour, our, our sorrow, what happens is we get to feel the pain of somebody else. When my mother died, I was asked to speak at my mother's funeral, and I've never spoken at a funeral the same ever again because it was my mother I was talking about. It was my mother that was in that casket. I know what sorrow is all about. I felt it. It's good for you. It's good to grieve. It's good to be sorrowful because it's human. Because to to the degree that you sorrow, it's to the degree that you love that individual. If you don't care, it's because you had no relationship with that person. 
There's a lot of people here that had a relationship with this guy, though. Unbelievable. So the fourth thing is to realize that sorrow is good. You don't have to hold it back. I cry more now as a 75-year-old man than I did any time, even when my father got a hold of me when I was a kid, a lot more. <laughs> Number five. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. Verse 5, I believe it is in Ecclesiastes 7. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. People react different ways to this message. In Acts, chapter, in Acts chapter 17, there's three ways that people react to a message like this. Categorize yourself, all right? Number one, some people believe. Number two, some people mock. Number three, some people, I heard it, uh, and we'll talk about it later on sometime. Which one of those three categories do you fit in? Do you believe? Are you a mocker? Or do you say, yeah, I, I could hear more of this. I'm willing to listen. One and three work out pretty well. I was a mocker before I came to Christ. I know what it's like to be on the other side. A mocker making fun of spirituality until you really get down to the deep and important things of life. And that's where they are. They're in the spiritual realm. They're not in your wallet they're not in the deed to your house or to your, in your automobile. The important things of life are spiritual things of life. God's plan and purpose in this world is the redemption of all mankind. His purpose for you is to save you, to save you from your sins, to save you from yourself. And he's paid the price. All you have to do is say, I'm sorry, God, I messed it up like every other human being messes it up. I messed it up, and I have my faith and put my faith in what Christ did for me on the cross, and I'm asking you to forgive me and save me and give me salvation, give me the gift of eternal life. That's how simple it is. Would you do that? It took me weeks to understand that. For some of you, you're hearing it for the first time, and your theological mind is discombobulated right now. Let me say it one more time. You're a creation of God. You are broken. You are a sinner. And God has paid the price to save you and forgive you and give you the gift of eternal life. And Jesus is the way to do that. That's the simple gospel message. That's the seed of the word of God that I'm sowing today, hopefully in your soul, that will bring forth fruit in you. God's plan and purpose in this world is the redemption of the forgiveness of all mankind, restoration, eternal life. You must have faith in the right gospel in Christ. You must repent. You must be willing to forsake and turn from your own sin to bring salvation and forgiveness. The message that I'm bringing you right now is Gary's message. This is what he told me to tell you. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> Go ahead and get upset at him. But I agree with him 100%. I wouldn't have done this if I didn't agree with him. This is the greatest honor of my life to stand here at this, with this group of people for Gary Bykirk. This is the moment for which I was born. <laughs> I told Gary years ago, I said, you see that metal around your neck? That's granted you access to people that most of us will never, ever be able to talk to. Ever be able to talk to. Like I was telling him something, right? <laughs> Boy, I'm smart. You know what? I stopped for a moment and Gary's gone. And I said, you know what? That metal around Gary's neck. That has granted me access to what may be the most important group of people that I have ever spoken to in my ministry in 50 years. Right here. This could be the moment for which God gave me life. This is important for every 
single one of us. I'm done. Gary didn't tell me to say any more than that. But I will repeat this. Some believe, some mock, and some say, I'll hear you again. Which group do you fall in? Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer with me? Father, I know Gary's within your reach. I did what he asked me to do, Gary. Gary, I did what, I, what he asked me to do. Oh, what, a, what a privilege to stand here on your behalf and preach the most important message to the world. God, God, tell Gary I'm so appreciative of his friendship and his love over the years. Now you can do one of three things. You can believe, you can mock, or you can postpone, you can procrastinate, you can think about or talk about this at a later date. But for those of you that do or want to believe, let me share with you a simple prayer. A prayer that I prayed 50 years ago that brought me to faith in Christ. I realized that I was a sinner, that I was lost without Christ. I believed that about myself. I believed that Jesus Christ was God in flesh and that he came to die for me and all of us on the cross to pay for our sins. And I put my faith in what he did for me, not what I can do for him with a repentant attitude. I called upon the name of the Lord and he saved me. Here's the prayer. If you want to pray with me, I'm going to go slowly so you can cogitate. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I take my place with the human race. I am one of billions, one of your creations. I'm broken. I'm fallen. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Your son, God's son, God incarnate, God in flesh, came to this earth, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, came to this earth to go to the cross, to shed his blood, to pay for my sins and the sins of all of these people here and all the people everywhere. Now, Lord, if we would just repent, Lord, I repent. I am sorry. I am sorry that I've offended you. I'm sorry I've sinned against you. I'm asking you to forgive me. And I put my faith only in what Christ did for me on that cross. Lord, give me the gift of eternal life. Take me home to heaven when I die. Lord, I want to see Gary Bykirk again and talk to him again. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh my, I'm emotionally spent after that. I really am. Where is the... It's on the shelf. The shelf here? <laughs> I don't see it, Mike. Huh? Under the pulpit? On the... Oh, it's on the pulpit. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's too obvious for people like me. I'm too intelligent to find the obvious. <laughs> Ultimate questions. There's lots of these in the lobby as you exit. This book answers the most important questions about what was the most important thing to Gary Bykirk. Take it and read it. That's all we ask. There's no cost to this. Take it and read it. It's incredibly valuable. If you've never heard anything like this, go through it slowly. Take your time and read one of the articles and then stop and evaluate yourself and evaluate your life and evaluate your relationship with God. Would you do that for me, please? God bless all of you. Greater love hath no man than this. Those of you military people, those of you who are firefighters and police officers and first responders, you know what it means to put your life on the line. God bless you, and we thank you for your service and your willingness to love us the way you do. Thank you for being here. Mike. Thank you, Pastor.
Um, we're going to watch a video that Gary, he's, the video we had in the beginning in this one, Gary asked to, us to show to you because it, it was his heart. So watch this video and then I'll come and pray. When you can't walk And there's chains round your soul The burden's too heavy And you've run out of room And you're praying out loud As you stumble I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and then I have an announcement for everybody before we leave, okay? Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for Gary. Thank you for his love for you and his testimony that has shown throughout this whole world. I ask you now to help his family as they have suffered a great loss. I pray that you comfort them as only the Holy Spirit can. It's my prayer that the gospel message didn't be issued in vain today because Gary desperately wanted everyone that came today to know Jesus as their Savior. That was his prayer. He wants to see you in heaven. So, Lord, I'm thankful that we did what he asked us to do today. And uh, I'm glad <laughs> you'll carry him home.
Love you, Gary. Thank you for your friendship and your love for Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this concludes the memorial service for Gary. The family would like to thank you all for coming today and being a part of this, for your love and support. Following the service, the family will proceed to the graveside for a private internment. And so the military is going to come and escort the family, and then we'd like the Medal of Honor recipients to follow, and then um, the dignitaries that are here, if you'd follow and process out, and then any military over here, would you follow also? We'll proceed to uh, take Gary's body to the hearse, and then we'll proceed to the graveside internment. So thank you for being a part of this today. We appreciate and love every one of you. Thank you.